So, Jared, you spent a lot of time, especially in Syria, looking at the Middle East and Arab Spring. Um, and now we've got Syria, which has escalated and has been today, you said two hours ago, Eric? Two hours ago, uh, Syria shut down the internet again. Yeah. I mean, the, the way to think about what's happening in Syria is to look at what some of the problems are at this very moment and then try to imagine how these problems would play out in the future. So right now, everybody's trying to figure out, did they use chemical weapons? Did they not? Because the implication, there's serious implications given the Obama administration said they were drawing a red line uh, with, with uh, use of chemical weapons, which as an aside, by the way, uh, lots of rebels were upset about this because it basically said everything else up to that is fine. So in the future, uh, there'd be no question about whether chemical weapons were used, uh, where they were used, uh, how widely they were used, because everybody would have smartphones and be able to document this. And even if the internet was shut down, they'd be able to share it peer to peer. The other problem that we see today is nobody knows who these rebels are. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, that's a problem not just for the US, that's a problem for the rebels themselves. Now, smart rebels in the future will learn from Syria in uh, 2013 and in the equivalent in 2023 will say, OK, there's a problem that I'm the good guy. And I'm worried that people are going to think I'm the bad guy. So I'm going to, before I try to overthrow the government, start marketing myself and describe what type of government I want to see, what our values are, how we'll set up a finance ministry, um, who we're going to appoint to the cabinet, and essentially build a whole government uh, that will be put in place after a rebel movement that I haven't formed yet succeeds in overthrowing a government that I haven't started to launch an attack against yet. And so the smart rebel of the future will do a lot of planning. And they'll be a celebrity, it sounds like, right? Because yeah. they're following and, and What's interesting, if you, look, if you look at Twitter, Twitter, I think, shows you how many people want to be a celebrity in their own context. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Twitter is essentially about building a follower, building a crowd, Absolutely. you know, keeping Absolutely. them excited about what you're doing. You know, here I am, here's what I'm doing, here's my yes. product, and so forth. This is a universal, a universal human need. Um, and by the way, you know, China has a, a version of Twitter, which is known as Weibo, which has, you know, more than 300 million users. Yes. So this phenomenon is not just a U U.S. phenomenon. I know, it's not. Absolutely not. So one other thing, uh, University of Texas student a few days ago manufactured the first th fully functioning 3D printed operating gun. And we are I mean, in this whole new world and the files and are the, online. And, and Well, of course, the concern with the 3D printing of the plastic gun is that the plastic gun will go through the x-ray machines. The people who believe in gun control would argue, well, there's a lot of guns that, that are already known, but there's a separate discussion. So the fact of the matter is that the 3D printers can produce things which are undetectable by traditional means. The good news is that most of them don't work and they jam after a couple of shots, but one but shot is But this is the first, the first iteration. Yeah. So are we going to have licenses well, for 3D printers? In the, book we talk, in the book we talk about the advent of 3D printing. The, what you're seeing is the democratization of everything. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing the democratization of information, the democratization of access, the democratization of medicine, mm -hmm. and the democratization of manufacturing. 3D printing will never be as cheap as volume manufacturing, but if you need something special, and especially something that's a little bit prohibited, yes. um, there's a good chance that if you have means, you can get it built by a 3D printer. 3D printers, for what you don't, if you have not seen them, take a computer file and they make the pieces uh, through a specialized milling process, and then you can assemble the pieces together. Absolutely. Um, Jared, when you were in the State Department, or maybe it was part of the State Department in 2008 with the um, uh, Green Revolution in Iran, you made a call to Twitter because you were concerned. You want to talk about that story a little bit? Because I think it's interesting and it's got replications about the next thing I want to ask. Before well, we so there, there, there's a backstory to, of course, you're referring to the Green Revolution in, in, in Iran in June of 2009. Um, there, there's a backstory to this, which I, I, was, I was spent a bunch of time in Iran in 2004 and 2005. Uh, and I was traveling and uh, wandering around some of the, the bazaars, which are their marketplaces, and I found all these young people using Bluetooth not to talk and drive at the same time, but to, in a very creepy way, call and text complete strangers to essentially try to figure out where the party was or to, to, to get a date. Like chat roulette? Um, not, as, not as creepy <laughs> not as that, which, by the way, not for, quite that creepy. <laughs> for okay. those of you that have seen Trap Roulette, you know, it's, it's traumatizing. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but but I, I came back after my trip to Iran, and I was talking about all these ways that young people are using technology in different ways than we imagine in the U.S. to flirt. And they said, well, why does that matter? And I said, because they're organizing to do things they're not allowed to do, and one day that will take on a political significance. So fast forward to June of 2009. The population pours into the streets in protests of the elections. The government shuts down the internet. 
they shut down the mobile carriers and all of a sudden the tools of flirtation, which allowed people to call and text strangers via Bluetooth, become one of the only ways that the population can share videos and share message uh, device to device, even though the networks are shut down. So the tools of flirtation became a very powerful revolutionary tool. So I'd been watching this closely and then I followed the opposition leader, uh, Musavi, on Twitter and he posted that uh, Twitter was going to do a scheduled maintenance of their site and they were, don't worry, they were going to do it at a time that was convenient for Americans. And so I contacted uh, my friend Jack Dorsey there to uh, essentially say, can you do it at a time that's convenient for Iranians uh, instead of Americans? I know it's like bad for business, but you know, you guys, it, it's the right thing to do. And this was at a time where the industry was still not paying as much attention to the ways that technology was being used in contexts like this, something which is hard for us to imagine now. And so they agreed to uh, reschedule their delayed maintenance. And of course, I almost got fired for it because people said I meddled in Iran, uh, <laughs> which the president said not to do. Um, and I I'll spare you what I was told Rahm Emanuel said when he found out. I'd like to hear that over it drink later on. It upstairs, involves some yeah. not so nice four letter let's words. Just say that, let's just say that Jared is no longer at the State Department. No longer, yes. <laughs> but I survived a little bit longer, yeah. So, um, Following on that, I think that certainly with Google and where you guys have sat and you've been straddling the State Department, the State Department and Google and, and Eric with, with your travels, um, there will be more and more the chumminess of Silicon Valley that you guys know people that you can have that kind of effect where if you see something and you believe it's, it could have a dramatic effect, good or bad, you make a phone call to a friend of yours and, and you become much more involved in statecraft than the private sector typically is. I think that's true, but we've come to a view that the tech, the te well, a couple things. The tech industry is one of America's greatest exports, not because of its products, but because of its values. So tech companies, when they're operating, it's true of American companies mm -hmm. in general, in these countries, have to operate by American law, which includes, for example, anti-discrimination clauses. You actually have to employ women. You have to pay people the same, these sorts of things. Yes. And so we're seeing, I think, is in, in, in I think our view, um, a, a serious beacon of American values, which I think is excellent. It turns out that when you talk to people not in the United States, they believe that the internet is essentially American hegemony against mm -hmm. their countries. And uh, Jared makes the point that imagine if the internet was designed by the Chinese, right? It'd be, have a very different architecture. Yeah. The information would be trapped in places. There would be approval cycles. There would be ways of deleting things that do not exist today. Mm -hmm. So it would, be, it would be arrogant for us to assume that, um, that, our, that our impact is uh, trivial. Right. That, that engineers make these decisions. They have a natural bias. Engineers have a natural bias to keep things, right? They have a ma natural bias to transmit things. And the sum of all that creates the internet architecture that we're dealing with today, which has a number of consequences, like the lack of a delete button, this sort of excessive communications capability, which we think is one of the values. One of the things you talk about in, uh, in this uh, creating of identity and, and citizenship is that people who don't have a sense of what, uh, of the persistence of information at transforming their lives and the possibility of having a delete when you turn 18 to be able to delete everything you did up until that point in time. Well, well my, my suggestion was that when you're 18, my suggestion, <laughs> great, my serious it? suggestion when you're 18 is you, that it should be appropriate and, and culturally correct to simply change your name. So then you can say that wasn't no me. No witness protection, right? That the wasn't me. That, you know, that wasn't me. I didn't do that. Those pictures, that was someone else. I was at that high school, but they had a different name. Uh, and by the way, that's a joke. Uh, so, of all the multiple identities online, it's but, not but, such a joke. But, but, the, but, but the serious point is we've got this, um, another way of thinking about it. And, and Jared, you pointed out that people are putting pictures. There's sonograms online, which is weird, but Jared, Jared, is, Jared is very upset about the sonogram point. Can you well, make your point to you, the perspective moms You should not be here. allowed to introduce your unborn child into data permanence until your child at least comes out of the womb. I think there should be like a law. There's a whole right to life on piece this. on this. I so, think. So, I like a so in the question of regulation, this is a Regulate law. This is a, of the sonograms. You want a yeah. regulation that prohibits the uploading of sonogram pictures this before where, birth. This is the battle I choose. After, after, after so, they're, I feel very strongly about after this. they're born, it's okay to upgrade the pictures. Well, I haven't decided yet. I'm so focused okay. on the sonograms that. <laughs> Well, okay. it's the point of conception versus the point of birth is what you're talking about. But there, there is a serious <laughs> point somewhere <laughs> yes, in here. Yes. Um, and you know, the, the, the point that, that we, we make in the book, it, it's subtle, but we find ourselves talking about it a lot because after we give talks, parents come up to us and talk about how freaked out they are that their you know, child is using a tablet but, you know, and barely able to talk, and they worry about you know, what they might be able to do. And our, our, what we basically say to parents anywhere in the world is, 
you know, if your kids are coming online faster than their physical uh, maturity, then you should talk to them about online privacy and security before you talk to them about sex. It's not going to be relevant to talk to them about sex for years, but it is going to be relevant to talk to them about what they say and do online very early. And that's not just in a place like New York. Let's go to a place like Saudi Arabia, where Eric and I have both spent time. You know, a girl who is seven years old uh, doesn't yet have the experience and has not yet been socialized in a sufficient way into Saudi society to understand the full breadth and consequences for what she may say or do online. So she may do something when she's six or seven that essentially creates a digital scarlet letter for her that will follow her for the rest of her life. And we're now beginning to see uh, much more serious examples than, than a seven-year-old. Uh, teenagers who are falsely accused or even ones that have been accused that in the normal process the records would be expunged. Now because it's on the internet, they apply for a job, they say, have you ever been convicted? They can legally say no uh, because they were, they're now adults and it was expunged, but it wasn't expunged from the yeah. internet. Yeah. And this notion, uh, this, this no it violates sort of the notion of fairness that Americans have, mm -hmm. but it's a very, very real issue. So as parents, you need to address this, but it's, it's not a completely solved problem in my view in the internet. Well, and issues like um, um, honor killings, yeah. Cyber honor killings. You can imagine all kinds of things taking place in the digital world. We've mm. got such an amazing crowd here. I feel like we need to open it up to questions because many more interesting questions will come from you. We have some uh, uh, microphones, and um, and I can't. Is that you, Chris Anderson, back there? Yes, that's. Can Chris. you can you stand and, and ask your questions so we can hear? Because we're filming, so yeah. that's. So I, I agree with your distinction between reflective and, and lizard brain, but I disagree with you that the apps and architecture will be dr um, driven by uh, clicks. There's a lot of evidence that the next generation of computer users will be sophisticated applications, which will have very different kinds of user interfaces. For example, they'll be spoken to rather than clicking. So I'd, I would encourage you to think of it more as a question of how do we ensure that there are apps which are based on detailed knowledge Real, the real pursuit of information, those sorts of things, rather than fads and so forth. The question you asked has been asked for hundreds of years. It was a concern, and radio was a concern, and newspapers and so forth. And somehow we managed to get through it. There is an issue that the crowd gets sort of moved by either celebrity or scandal or a false statement and so forth. But the internet has proven itself remarkably adept at correcting itself very, very quickly. And I think that the sum of the brain is quite reflective. And the app should propagate that. There you go. Other questions? Oh, come on. I know we've got some good ones here. Yeah, I can't. Heidi? No. 